Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Sam Shao from the Cytel Strategic Consulting Team. I'm now delighted to introduce my colleague from Cytel, Natasha Raichik, Principal of Strategic Consulting, who will be our webinar presenter today. Natasha has been a practicing biostatistician for over 20 years. At Cytel, she helps clients explore and apply appropriate study designs and address difficult clinical development problems. Her experiences range from studies employing advanced methods to dose escalation to, a, to late stage regulatory interactions on product development issues. In today's webinar, Adaptive Trials for Non-Statisticians, Natasha will share the knowledge you need to make more informed decisions about applying adaptive trials in your organizations. She will walk us through the adaptive concept, the potential benefit, the potential beneficial outcomes, types of adaptive trials, and scenarios in which they can be applied. She will also share a number of real life practical case studies that illustrate these key points. Uh, Natasha, uh, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Sam. Um, I just uh, wanna check if everybody can hear me. Um, you can send a note to the organizers, if not, and then they'll let me know. Um, I am Natasha Rajic. I am calling today from the Pacific Northwest. It is still kind of dark here, so a shout out to all the people who joined from the West Coast. I know it's early. Um, I am really excited to give this presentation today. I gave forms of it before in different venues, uh, different settings, but um, one thing that I realized that I uh, may change for the future presentations on this topic is um, not calling it adaptive trial designs for non-statisticians. It's more of adaptive trial designs in practice. Uh, not to scare you, I, I won't be talking much of um, statistical theory, but um, um, the, 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 the things that I'll be talking today um, should apply across the um, um, people who are involved in clinical trials and clinical trial development at various organizations, um, including statisticians. Um, it's really about how to think about adaptive designs in practice and how to try to implement them at, at, in real life scenarios. So with that in mind, I will uh, unpause my screen. Let's do that first. And then I will also, just as a form of introduction, I'll, um, hello, as you can see, it's still a little bit dark back there. This is Natasha, so I'll turn this off. Just wanted to show my face so you know who I am. There you go. Okay. And I'm also glad to have Sam here because he's, uh, he's a colleague at uh, uh, Strategic Consulting at Cytel with plenty of experience in these things. He, um, so he's, he's a perfect moderator for this session. So as a start, I will show you just excerpts, uh, excerpts from the adaptive design um, definition that FDA provides. And as you know, other uh, regulatory bodies or scientific bodies have similar definitions of what the adaptive designs are. Um, and all of, the, all of those definitions in one way or the other emphasize that the adaptive design is um, study that prospectively plans uh, adaptations and modifications and preferably uh, those modifications are specified prior to unblinding of the data. Well, that not preferably, definitely prior to unblinding of the data and preferably at the initial protocol design stage. But it is, I've, we've seen at Cytel many uh, examples when uh, adaptations are specified um, after the, uh, this, the study has already started. Um, it uses adaptive design study, adaptively designed study, uses accumulating data to decide on how to modify aspects of the study. Um, and one thing that I will be emphasizing as we go along is, um, we, we already said that it's based on pre-specified decision and adaptation rules, 
But another thing that is very important is that it's, it does it without undermining the validity and the integrity of the trial. I, I won't be speaking directly to how to do that. And actually there was an earlier webinar earlier this year, somewhere around April that I gave on preparing um, documentation that specifies and addresses validity and integrity of the trial. Um, but it is something that is is not in, done in vacuum it, as we think about it, any trial really, but specifically adaptive design trials, um, something that's front and center, uh, which is always making sure that validity and integrity of the trial is not undermined. It, adaptive designs maybe a couple of years ago or, or a decade um, become, became more um, prevalent in practice. But in a lot of circles, they're still viewed as something that maybe the regulatory agencies are not accepting as keenly or that there's, there's some risk aversion um, towards adaptive designs, at least in the past, um, from, from the industry. Um, thinking that maybe um, regulatory agencies are not um, super welcoming about him, which is not true anymore. He hasn't been for a while. Um, so that misconception should, should not persist anymore. Um, one of the, um, and just to illustrate that, that I'm, I'm showing you uh, one of the pilot programs that FDA launched in support of complex trial designs where they actually are, are calling out and, and accepting, um, uh, offering to give a, spe a special look um, into designs that are uh, adaptive or more complex, um, or kind of give them special attention in their review. As you can, as you expect, uh, over the years, the 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 their use has has been um, more prevalent in in the in the industry this graph goes only on to 2014 but um, you can imagine then that um, since then it, the trend only continued so just to remind ourselves why um, adaptive designs people are trying to adapt to designs for various reasons um, the reason to uh, save uh, a badly designed trial or failing or badly executed trial, that's certainly not, should not be, a, um, adaptive designs cannot do that. So that just to, to, to get that out of, out of the way. But what they can do is the increased knowledge efficiency, meaning you know, you learn things earlier and um, more efficiently uh, using um, less information from from fewer information at a certain time, which of course then can decrease development time, um, which is of course very important. Uh, if you can also do uh, take advantage of the stage investment of, and optimization of available resources, which decreases cost. M very importantly, you can mitigate or manage risks that we all know. Uh, are present from the beginning to the end in the clinical development. And uh, they also improve precision and quality information by calibrating initial design assumptions, which then increases your probability of success, of regulatory success, of, of, of technical success. When we talk about risks, um, just to set it up to know what, what are we actually talking about here, um, I'm, I'm thinking about risks of really unknowns, known and unknown unknowns uh, in the, at the stage of planning a, a trial design. If you ever had to uh, write a protocol document or just starting with a protocol synopsis, um, or just thinking about your clinical development program in general, among many things you have to think about or address are these things listed here as well. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty about these things, uh, whether you admit it or not. Sometimes people don't wanna even fully admit to themselves that 
they don't really know what that placebo effect is or they're not they're, they're, they're not information enough information is available or um, how many people we drop out of course we we always hope and think nobody will drop out drop out will be low but it may actually show up to be something different and all these other heterogeneous population is something that I see a lot um, um, almost not addressed as aggressively as it should it should be because um, especially in in um, earlier development so all of these things um, represent uncertainty in the uh, study design and development stage which adaptive designs really can help address or manage those risks and unknowns and here are some of the ways they can do that. So if you have a certainty about treatment effect or variability of the data, either early stopping or sample size re-estimation can help because they save underpowered trials, uh, less phase three failure, uh, you can stop, uh, adaptively correct, stop or reallocate resources, um, and then cert um, other examples as well. And I, have, I haven't listed all of the possible adaptation and all of the possible scenarios here. Um, the ones in a, in a dark blue, bold blue, are the ones that I will be mentioning for the rest of the presentation as examples. But you can imagine that um, other uncertainties and, and um, unknowns can be addressed with uh, uh, adaptive disease. These are kind of more the most uh, familiar to all of us. So for some of them include, of course, uncertainty about dose arm, which you want to take forward, whether you do that with dose response adaptive designs or dose selection in a seamless phase two, three, you save time and patience, select the optimal dose. Uncertainty about subpopulation, of, of course, the population enrichment can help with that. Um, or simply the work, um, drug doesn't work, you stop the full fertility early and uh, move on and, and reallocate your resources to something else. So now we'll go into uh, several types of adaptation and give examples and I'll talk about um, some of the things we, we need to be uh, on the lookout with, with each of them and also uh, illustrate what the particular adaptation is good for and of what kind of advantages they, they provide. Here I'm just throwing a, a visual presentation of the particular designs we'll talk about. Uh, we'll start with sample size re-estimation, the one top, top, top left. And then we'll also talk about um, switching the endpoints uh, midstream, um, seamless phase two, three for dose selection, uh, in population enrichment and uh, also um, uh, adaptive designs that, that manages uh, risks um, from um, a lack of information in the early stages. Okay, so first one we'll start with is uh, sample size estimation. I would think that that's the one that's maybe familiar to many of you. And the reason why I say that, because um, CITEL as, as a, a group that does a lot of adaptive designs, th those are the ones that we see a lot are people coming to us asking about them. So that's, that, that is just, I mean, otherwise I don't have, uh, being at CITEL, I, I kind of have a skewed view of what, what people are uh, really doing on the whole, because I don't, uh, clients that come to us and reach us are mostly interested in ad adaptive designs. Um, which, of course, it's, CITEL has um, services beyond that, but that that's, just seems to be uh, something that we are known for. Um, so why sample size re-estimation? Going back to those risks that you uh, uh, encounter at the beginning of the planning of the clinical trial development, or planning the, the trial. The true effect size um, that we wish to detect is, is 
maybe uh, and some certainty around it. Um, and you need the, the knowledge to be pretty solid to have adequate, adequate power for your trial. Otherwise, you, you may be just missing uh, a chance to find the significant results. Um, unknown variability, which is very common and people are um, often under, underestimating the potential for variability of their estimates um, and also underestimating how much they know about how, how, about variability, how variability may affect it. And, and then other ancillary information, for example, like correlation between co-primary endpoints, also very important, or some other. Uh, so, and inappropriate assumptions about these or, or many others can lead to underpowered trial and, and really a, a waste of resources and, and time and money for everyone. Uh, before I go into example of a sample size estimation based on promising zone, which is more interesting, I wanted to mention to mention uh, sample size estimation in general can be categorized into what's typically called blind and an unblind sample size estimation, meaning at the interim uh, whether the um, the proper way to really to say it, if you look at the new guidance uh, that came out of FDA in September 2018, it's a little bit misleading to call a blind and, and unblinded sample size estimation or interim analysis. It, we should really be saying uh, whether it's using comparative data at the interim or not using comparative data at the interim. Because blind and unblinded, the terms are typically reserved for um, whether patients or investigators or uh, study operational team is blinded to the individual study assignment, our typical kind of um, thinking about blind and unblinded. Whereas whether you uncover or know the, the treatment assignment to a particular subject at the interim um, has nothing to do with that. It's, it's whether you will use the comparative data or not at the interim. So I'm hoping those the, those terms become more familiar and, and get um, get to be used more. And the other reason is you may have unblinded study, meaning the patients and investigators are totally aware of what they they're assigned to or, or randomized to if it's a randomized study. Um, so the the in a in a usual sense the study is not blinded. But when it comes to uh, protecting the integrity of the trial um, and um, uh, validity of, of final estimates, the study team may be blinded perhaps to the um, aggregate data or aggregate summaries that involve primary endpoint or the statistical and programming team um, may be blinded to the assignment um, you know, in a kind of aggregate way. So you're still not uh, have access to randomization codes, um, even though the, uh, the, the study is quote unquote unblinded to the investigators and uh, per participants. So that's why I'm insisting on using this, this nomenclature of comparative versus non-comparative, using use of comparative versus non-comparative data at the interim. If not using comparative data in interim, so just looking at overall variance estimates to modify sample size, um, that does not have um, such a big impact of type one error. And it has some inflation of a possible type one error, the probability of, of a false rejection of null hypothesis, uh, but it's minimum compa com compared to when using comparative data. If on, if, on the other hand, you're using comparative data in interim analysis, so actually knowing what the treatment, for example, treatment effect is, so you're not just doing um, uh, as one on the left to kind of adjust for the inflated variance that you didn't account for in the beginning, but on the right, if you're actually looking at comparative data and estimating this, the treatment effect midstream at the interim analysis, that has important con uh, consideration for the control of type 1 error. So here we come to the, um, those two items that I was emphasizing, which is um, protecting the 
validity and also related integrity of the trial because validity means if you're doing some of these things you have to know whether um, you have to do some adjustments in order to protect the type 1 error at the end um, so some you would you would have to know that uh, different statistical uh, methodologies have to be applied to to protect the validity uh, and also um, in terms of integrity some of these this knowledge of interim results uh, for example should be pre-specified who has the access to it who knows of the interim results um, um, certainly protected from the operational team okay so sample size or estimation based on promising zone is example of a uh, Sample size or estimation based on comparative data at interim, meaning we um, estimate the um, uh, estimate of of, uh, of parameter of, of interest uh, for the primary endpoint, and and typically what we do also is um, calculate the conditional power, which is um, probability of observing a significant event given the information at the interim. Uh, and then based on that conditional power, there are other measures that can be used, but um, typically based on the conditional power, we at the interim, we decide or we have a rule pre-specified or whether sample size should be increased to recuperate the power that we originally thought we, we had. So this, what this is good for is mitigating risk of all initial overinvestment and also uh, mitigating risk of failing to detect the relevant um, uh, benefit, not just survival benefit, that's just one of the endpoints, possible endpoints. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about is, let's say that we do have a, a survival endpoint in a trial, a trial that is designed for 90% power, and in a, for a base case scenario where uh, since this is a time to event study, we exp express um, initial, these initial assumptions in terms of uh, median survival and ha hazard ratio. So let's say the base case ratio is designed as a superiority trial for ha a hazard ratio of 0.73. And this which would require a total of 490 subjects and 431 events with, with these um, as, uh, assumptions about median survival. And if the resources and, and um, are available and time is available, this, this would be perfect if this reflects the, um, the kind of solid assumptions that you are going with into a trial. But um, instead, you could design your study under an optimistic scenario, meaning um, has a ratio of 0.67, um, much long, not much, but uh, uh, substantially longer um, um, sub median survival in the active treatment arm compared to control. And this would require only 297 total sample size and 252 events. So smaller sample size, smaller number of events. Uh, but of course, it's an optimistic scenario. And then what you can do is perform um, sample size re-estimation midstream and see what happens if you design under the um, optimistic scenario under hazard ratio of 0.67, but see what happens if the true hazard ratio turns out to be higher than your optimistic scenario. Um, then you can design a trial that if based on the conditional power at the interim, um, you fall into the promising zone which is uh, pre-specified and defined, defined uh, uh, prior to, to unblinding and looking at this interim results. Um, so that with the uh, hazard ratio of 0.73, you would have had only 71% power at the end. But if you adapt, meaning add additional subjects, you can recuperate the power and have uh, power of 90, back to 90%. Um, of course, it would require uh, adding subjects, uh, but at least and and time. But at least do you uh, you are not uh, over power, not overpowered, but you're not putting your um, resources up front 
uh, unless you need to. And that's the, that's the, the beauty of this, this design. I should tell you that um, increase the, the increase in sample size or in, in case of time to event, it's increase in events. Um, it, it's not infinitive. It's, of course, you have to pre-specify uh, what is the cap of sample size that you, you're willing to go up to. And in practice, it shouldn't be more than um, two times the sample size that you started with. Um, because if you just increase indefinitely, you're, you're invalidating, of course, the, um, the statistical properties of your study. Um, and also, uh, it's, um, there's several ways you can construct this increase, whether it's continuous or, or up to the max or stepwise, and that has important connotations of how you're actually going to um, execute your interim analysis, and particularly has important connotations to um, protecting the integrity of the trial because if you increase um, sample size in a manner that one can then back calculate what the effect was at the interim um, then that can that could ruin the or, or threaten the integrity of the trial because people may be you know, s switching their behavior um, afterwards and really um, uh, it, it, the results that you're getting at the end are not not as as valid as as you think they are. So um, that's one thing that's very so that kind of touches on the operational aspects of, of these trials and something that you have to think about in advance and, and pre-specify and think about who's going to see what data at what point and also of course um, all the details about what is the when about conditional power and what is the interval for the when are you actually going to be increasing the samples and, and by, by how much. So another trial, that, another adaptation that I want to talk about is um, uh, interesting, which is really, um, as it says here, adaptive decision rule or endpoint selection, which is, just to set it up, this is another uh, real uh, life example. I give a reference there. Um, the it's a it's a um, cardiovascular trial which had a, a primary endpoint of a compos composite of first occurrence of CV death MI or stroke, and um, it it you know in in it has been agreed for this trial with the FDA to estimate the upper bound of 95 repeated confidence interval for the hazard ratio of active versus um, of, of control. Um, and if that has ratio is less than 1.8, um, the company would submit for pre-marketing NDA. And if it's less than 1.3, so even better, the uh, uh, CV safety would, would have been demonstrated. So the trial was designed as a non-inferiority trial that way. Um, it, it planned to accrue... Um, 5,400 5, subjects with uh, several interim analyses to estimate the upper bound of this repeated confidence interval. And if at the first interim analysis at 83 events, um, the upper bound actually was 151, so less than the pre-planned, pre-defined 1.8, um, uh, it was submission, submitted for the pre-NDA. Uh, um, uh, with FDA. And then uh, at the second interim analysis at the 550 events, um, when they were going to look whether it's less than 1.3 or, or the, that predefined uh, margin that I talked about in the previous slide, um, the actual upper bound turned out to be 1.17, so therefore less than 1.33, and the trial was stopped to claim non-inferiority as designed up front. But the actual hazard ratio was uh, even lower than that. It was 0 0.96, still not um, um, significant to, to um, um, you know, st still not far, far from one. But it definitely, you can see that there's a tre trend of, of hazard ratio going from 1.51. 1, 1 um, oh, sorry, the upper, upper uh, uh, 
confidence interval going from 1.51 to 1.17 and has the ratio been um, lower than uh, maybe initial, initially planned. So instead of stopping at that point for non-theory, the trial could have continued to the pre-planned 650 events in hopes of showing superiority. In other ways, in other words, why stop at 550 events and accept a non-inferiority claim if you could have gotten um, with a little bit more, you gotten superiority? Of course, at that point, if that change was not pre-planned, it couldn't, it, it could not have been done. But if it was, it was planned um, uh, at the at the design stage, then uh, the sponsor would have had a chance to do the interim analysis as 550 events. If the non-inferiority criteria is was met, um, they could then compute the conditional power for superiority and um, then switch to adaptive design and um, accrue more patients until um, and, and test the, the superiority at the end. And um, instead of stopping um, at 550 and claiming non-inferiority. Um, but this of course had to be pre-specified. So that's, that's um, the, the beauty of this that um, you can prospectively plan for eventualities and, and then when, when the time comes and, and, and you really are showing promising results or um, estimates that are, are far better than, than, not far better, but better than expected, you can um, adjust your trial and um, in this case, switch from non-inferiority to superiority trial. And as I have been trying to uh, emphasize all this time, it, extensive details need to be included in the charter, in the adaptation plan. Um, all of these things come with simulation plan uh, reports, meaning um, before you, uh, um, embark on, on accruing subjects and still in a planning stage, you should um, have extensive simulations to, to see the operational characteristics of um, various scenarios. Um, also important here that although the trial is expanded, only if the, in this particular case, only if the, at the interim 50, 550 events show promise of superiority, um, the actual decision that they, it was expanded should only be on a need-to-know basis. Uh, for example, drug supplied and IRS teams. Um, and this is important. This is again going back to that preservation of integrity. And when you when you prepare your documents and when you have interaction with regulatory bodies, they will ask you what how uh, the uh, documentation that that you planned on preserving the integrity of the trial, and then afterwards how you documents that you actually did. Um, the, the preservation was was done. What what are the doc um, that, that the data was known only to people who needed to know. And um, um, for example, in this case, the investigators may be told only that the adaptive design has a maximum sample size, but they wouldn't be um, a told of um, um, exactly of what what the sample size was at the in decided in, in the interim. Double blind design. It helps here to avoid bias, but I have seen, for example, uh, even this thing uh, of switching from non-inferiority to superiority being done on an uh, unblinded study, meaning patients and investigators are aware of the individual treatment but uh, assignment, but the knowledge of aggregate and comparative data is, and, and knowledge of the decision rules is not widely known, only for people who need to know. And then that's all in order to protect the integrity of the trial. So another example, so we went through sample size re-estimation based on either blind and unblinded or comparative non -com uh, and comparative data uh, based on calculating uh, conditional power the interim so promising zone designs, we also talked about, uh, the last one was switching from, um, endpoint switching in this particular case was from switching from non-inferiority to superiority. Now we'll talk about adaptive dose selection. So of course, um, selection, adequate 
and correct selection of the dose is very important for for many reasons. Um, and um, the the whole idea is that while you still don't know which what is the best dose, you are kind of in the learning phase. And once you select the, the right dose, you you enter the confirmatory phase. And sometimes, of course, more more than one dose is selected for phase three. But the idea is that the uh, dose finding typically happens in phase two uh, or the learning phase. And um, confirmatory phase, you have a, uh, um, a fewer number of doses or preferably single dose that you are um, using for your uh, phase three and reg registrational trials. So here we'll, we'll look at an example of um, if you had a study that is considering three, do three active doses and versus placebo. If you would uh, design a trial where people are just randomized to one of the four and then you follow out for whatever the uh, observational period is, and look at the primary endpoint. And um, this is actually coming from the real trial, um, a continuous endpoint. So at the end, um, if, if you just simply design it this way and look for, of course, you have to um, control for the multiplicity of testing here. There's three doses com compared to placebo. Um, using something simple as Bonferroni home test of for final analysis that uh, one of the ways to adjust for multiplicity of testing. This would require 130 subjects per arm. Um, I, of course, I didn't, I didn't tell you what the accept, expected uh, responses are, but you know, just as an illustration, um, this would require um, a total of 520 patients for 80% power. So can we do better than that? Um, we could do operationally seamless phase two, three, where in uh, basically you have two trials. One where a dose selection is made, um, where sponsor enrollment, enrollment is permitted. And this is important because um, these things, uh, the design may be such where uh, the sponsor is not uh, privy to the decisions of the DSNB. Um, or they're just informed, but they're not, they're not able to actually be uh, involved in the, in the decision making there. Um, and that's a purpose. But the one, um, the first trial would, um, as before, be, be three doses versus placebo. And the um, dose selection is made. And then the second trial is where the, the selected dose would be confirmed. Um, and for this particular scenario, this would require 200 in the first trial and then uh, 216 in the second, uh, already smaller number of subjects needed for this operational seamless phase two, three, 416 versus 520 as we had before. Um, and then we can actually do even better than that if in terms of um, number of subjects needed, where, which is inter inferentially seamless phase two, three, um, dose selection is done at interim analysis as before, but it may be without direct uh, decision making from the sponsor only through the DSMB. And the final analysis is such that it combines the data from both stages. And you can imagine the, the specific uh, st statistical approaches need to be used to, to do that. Um, but it is possible to then have analysis that combines data from both stages, and this design then requires only 350 patients for the 80% power. So these are the um, comparison on the sample size. So if you look strictly at the savings of the sample size, um, of course, uh, inferentially seamless phase two, three seem, looks more most attractive. But as as you can imagine, as as I was describing these designs, there are things um, to consider about whether um, sponsor is involved or not, uh, whether you have a pause between the two phases, um, 
whether so if there are other things that are unclear for example safety or subgroup analysis uh, the specific subpopulation analyses um, no, uh, inferentially seamless may not always be uh, feasible or the best option in every case this is another uh, example of seamless 2-3 trial, but specifically for uh, mitigation of risk on unknown early assumptions. And uh, you'll see what I mean by that. And this is actually a trial that Sam worked on, and I, I like the example very much. Um, it combines Bay Bayesian decision-making with frequency test analysis in a phase 2-3 oncology trial. Uh, just to give you an uh, in introduction, it, uh, it's a rare uh, disease poor prognosis, um, cancer, um, oncology indication. Patient recruitment is, uh, it is a significant factor here in scarcity of the previous data. Um, there were some data available for free previous phase two trial, but insufficient to reliably uh, play in the phase three study. So, and another standalone phase two study was not feasible my, primarily for, for the scan scarcity of the patient population. So how to design a pivotal trial that makes produ productive use of, of, what, of that information that's available and, um, um, and also combine, trying to combine uh, the two phases into one for, to save on, on um, precious patient population. So, here, it, um, the, the study was time to event study, uh, and it used a couple of stages um, and early looks to try to make decisions and kind of mitigate risks as, as we go along. Um, the first interim analysis was a futility analysis based on a surrogate endpoint to the overall survival to on PFS. And it was based on only on 95 PFS events and using Bayesian rules to um, um, kind of have a go, no go decision uh, around the futility analysis. And then uh, as more um, overall survival events were accrued, um, a sample size reestimation was done uh, in addition to either early stopping for, utility, for efficacy or futility. Um, and then the final analysis of if 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 the if the trial didn't stop for efficacy or utility and the second interim, then the third the the final checkpoint would be a final analysis with oral survival as an endpoint. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this the, the what I said the it's the it's an example of mitigation of risk, not knowing. Um, not having enough information to to start with on all kinds of that or all all kinds of information that is needed to properly uh, plan and empower the trial um, but this way you have uh, kind of checkpoints or ways to um, either do a early go no go in terms of futility or increase sample size or stop for efficacy um, it also um, uses um, information on, on surrogate endpoint of PFS events. I, I call it surrogate here because the primary endpoint is overall survival. So a lot of ways to use the information and make the adaptation adjustments to the knowledge. So that's why I said in the beginning, efficient use of knowledge as you go along the um, adaptive trial. So the last example is adaptive population enrichment. And um, for this, uh, given the example of a, a cardiovascular study, which had a composite primary endpoint uh, versus a, a well-studied uh, standard of care comparator. And um, what was interesting here is that the study was well-powered if the risk ratio was greater than 20%. But um, the risk ratio of, um, of um, greater than 16% was still clinically meaningful. However, to power the study for 16% would require a huge study, a 1,400 subject study. 
And the study as was, was designed for 16%, it, has, it had only 63% power. In addition, there was a, um, in, there was a notion that the active treatment could be more potent in high risk, risk group, subgroups, but that was, that was not confirmed or that was not known for sure at the beginning. Otherwise, it would probably be, um, the study would be designed only for high risk subgroup. Um, so the adaptive strategy it can help in these in these um, scenario uncertainty by looking at the interim analysis um, benefit in the, in predefined specific subgroups based on on on, on risk um, defined by typically by a biomarker and then restrict further involvement to those subgroups where the uh, benefit is is um, um, indicated as, as higher. And that way, uh, you can increase sample size for those subgroups and stop enrollment in, in those not showing up uh, promising results. So this is from the actual trial that, um, that trial that I, that, that I introduced. And um, the, what, what happens is that at the interim analysis, a number of events is observed in the subgroups. And then if no response in both subgroups is observed, um, the trial will stop for futility. But if the response is, um, and of course, if, if there is a response in both groups, then it would just continue as, as, um, as planned. But if the response is only seen in one of the subgroups, then um, the, the subgroup that was not seen, seen as efficacious would be dropped and uh, or or different uh, the accrual would stop in that subgroup, and it, and you would assign all the remaining patients to the one that um, um, that uh, um, showed the promise. And again, at the end, this all sounds very um, intuitive, but you have to remember at the end, you in order to preserve the the validity of the results, you need to perform. Um, um, appropriate statistical testing that accounts for you looking at the interim and selecting a subgroup. So that's called, a, in this case, it's called a close test of subgroup. Um, and um, I want to mention that for the most, for the, a lot of the statistical methodology is there and has been done way almost years before it has been implemented in practice. So. Um, I can, I, I, it, it, I, if you're thinking about adaptive designs, um, you should be able to find statisticians who can implement it to ensure the validity of the tests and of the final um, conclusions. But you also need to work with um, people who know how to implement this so that the integrity is preserved as well. So going back to that, those two important um, aspects that I mentioned in the beginning, validity and integrity of the trial uh, that is adaptively designed. So here, last couple of slides, um, I mentioned simulation and operating characteristics. Um, those should be evaluated uh, prospectively and be in, included in documents um, that document your adaptive design. And these are some of the things that you would look at. I would, I would, I would not go through those. Um, as I said, there was an earlier webinar that I gave in April of this year where I go a little bit more into detail of how you would prepare documentation that around adaptive designs or adaptive design studies. And as I said in the beginning, um, they are not, there are in, they're accepted, I wouldn't even say increasingly, they're accepted, the depth design accepted. Um, there are various versions of it. Um, they're not always, uh, they, they need to be looked at in the context of the overall submission package and your development plan. They have to make sense for what you're trying to do. Um, regulators, regulators like to see adequate review time and early consultations when adaptive designs are involved. And um, they are accepted by the health authorities, but 
the more complex designs, maybe a case by case um, consideration. You need to start these planning and discussions early. And um, as I said, not they're not always ap appropriate for every situation, but you have to place them in within your all uh, the whole uh, clinical development plan and uh, uh, evaluate, uh, compare them against uh, uh, more more traditional options and strategies um, in order to really uh, make use of them. Um, so I'll, I'll, going back to the top, need they nef definitely need to be prospectively planned, ideally before your your protocol is finalized. But as I said, I I've, I've have seen accepted adaptations that that were planned after they were added after the study already started. Um, maintaining validity and integrity of the trial is important. Um, so control of type one error kind of a, a, a alludes to the validity and uh, need for firewalls and logistics alludes to integrity. And uh, with that, I will just flash a, a, a page of references to you. But uh, this concludes my presentation. Um, I will, this is my contact information. This is my cat looking at my um, east screen. I will now turn over to Sam and will be happy to answer any questions for the remaining of the time. We have six minutes. Okay, thank you, Natasha, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, we're now gonna begin answering the questions we've received. And as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, one question, Natasha, is um, are there certain adaptations that are generally considered to be simpler to do and better accepted by regulatory authorities than others? Yes. Um, the, the answer is definitely yes. And I wish I had a slide with where we actually categorize uh, adaptations. I, I have it in my mind now, but um, and categorizing them by um, exactly by regulatory acceptance, what has been accepted as almost as as usual, and some that are case by case basis. So some that are accepted as normal or even explicitly stated as preferred would be adaptations that I I didn't really talk about. These examples that I had is mostly for phase two three, but um, Adaptive designs in early phase, phase one, phase one B, two A, for doses, finding the optimal dose, find them uh, MTD or OPB, uh, or o OBT, sorry, um, and other, uh, those designs are, um, I've, I've seen FDA coming back and actually suggesting instead of the typical three by three suggesting why don't you use this or that. So there's a whole slew of adaptive um, dose finding and dose escalation dose finding designs that are available. So uh, those I would put in kind of the most accepted. Um, sample size or estimation based on non-comparative data is something that has been done for decades now. I remember first time doing it literally maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and then the, for the rest of them, um, there's so many, so much of variations of it that I think it's really a case by case basis because I've seen, for example, um, dose finding, adaptive dose finding in single two, three, if the disease is rare and, um, Specifics around the um, the assay that's used for for treatment for dose selection and, and the end of phase two are well defined. Then those those um, adaptive dose findings really be um, example really be accepted with with uh, kind of a uh, natural choice. But sometimes in other cases, uh, a little bit more in depth consideration needs to be done for, for some of the dose, those adapt, adaptive dose finding studies. Um, sample size re-estimation, it just by nature of CETEL, we see those a lot. So um, I don't 
I would say those are pretty well accepted. Um, I can't think of any that are considered um, kind of stay away zone. I, I really I don't know. How about you, Sam? Do, do any anything comes to mind? Uh, no, nothing that's outright stay away. Uh, you know, I, I think it does get quite context dependent and certain designs would require a lot more um, convincing, I think, simulations and why why not do a simpler design. But yeah. um, yep. Uh, so, so how about how about Natasha, we move on to one more question. Um, the, the if an organization decides to explore um, adopt an adaptive design, you know, what what should they do first? What does the first step look like? Uh, sorry, if if the sponsor wants yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. If they're looking into adaptive designs, uh, what mm -hmm. would they do first uh, in their? Oh, um, <laughs> they would contact uh, uh, <laughs> um, people who have done it before. Uh, but I would look at uh, the, the. I mentioned clinical development plan many times. I would look at how. Uh, a particular adaptive design would fit in the overall strategy. So you need to have your whole clinical and biostatistics, a knowledgeable biostatistics team and uh, regulatory and all other functions so that everybody understands what a potential adaptive design, what the benefits and possibly um, um, operational characteristics of the adaptive design, what would that mean for the overall development? So to kind of have everybody on board uh, within your organization that this is what you want to do. Um, and then uh, I would I would jump into um, uh, trying to, to, starting from the as much as information you can gather, um, trying to, to do simulations and, and you know, see the operational characteristics of, of such design. And um, of course, then uh, proceed with the decision or whether to do it or not. Uh, and we, I think, have time for a very quick question, which is, do you have mm -hmm. a textbook to recommend on adaptive designs? Oh, oh, that's a good question. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> There's all kinds of books. Uh, I don't have one in, that's a good question, maybe something to think about. I, I turn to papers. Um, I wish I can, I can, I'm sure there is a good book out there, or more than one. Um, but um, I, 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 no, I don't want to. Yeah, uh, well, and, and I think um, that that's probably where we need to wrap it up. I know there are a couple more questions, but we're, uh, we are out of time. And thank you, so Natasha. We'll, we'll get the questions and we can answer them by email. That's rest assured, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll try to answer them by email. Yeah, um, and thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh,